Good evening, everybody. Thank you for joining our uh, session today. And we are, my name is Shruti Bhatnagar. I'm the chair of the Sierra Club Montgomery County Group. And today we are going to talk about transit equity and health and safety of transit workers. Um, I want to start by introducing our panelists today. We have with us Mr. Christopher Conklin, who is the director of Montgomery County Department of Transportation. He was appointed to this position in October 2019 and served as the deputy director for transportation policy since joining the county in August of 2016. Prior to joining MCDOT, Mr. Conklin spent 23 years at the planning, engineering, and environmental firm VHB, where he was managing director for the national capital region. He is recognized for his experience in multimodal transportation strategy, planning, engineering, stakeholder and public participation, project management, and team leadership. During his career, he has worked with transportation organizations throughout the nation, including cities and towns, counties, states, and regional transit agencies, including federal agencies as well. And we also have Hannah Hen, who is the Deputy Director for Policy at MCDOT. Um, Gino Rene is president of UFCW Local 1994 MGO, the union that represents approximately 8,000 public and private sector workers, primarily in Montgomery County and Prince George's counties, as well as Cumberland City. Gino is also an international vice president of the United Food and Commercial Workers Union, representing 1.3 million workers across North America. For the past 44 years from the time he began his Montgomery County career as a correctional officer, Gino has been on the front line fighting for economic and social justice. Ray Lee is the special assistant to the president. He oversees McGeo's organizing activities as well as the union's representational responsibilities. And when I say special assistant to the president, let me make sure I'm referring to McGeo's president. Um, Ashanti Martinez is a re research and policy analyst for CASA, representing the interest of their members in Prince George's and Montgomery counties. He has formerly served as staffer to the Prince George's County Council member, Thomas E. Dernoga, staffer to the Maryland Legislative's Latino Caucus and deputy political director to delegate Joselina Penemele. Ashanti was named in the top 30 under 30 by 93.9 WKYS in 2017 and was also featured on the 40 under 40 by Prince George's County Social Innovation Fund. And now I want to introduce our amazing Sierra Club team. Um, I have Tina Slater, who is the chair of our transportation committee. Tina is an art teacher and transit advocate, and she wants to see more transit oriented development and mixed income housing around activity centers throughout Montgomery County and in the DC region. And she cannot wait for the Purple Line light rail to open in 2023 that goes from Silver Spring to Bethesda in under nine minutes. Clint Sobrati is a ride-on bus driver and transit coordinator, as well as a shop steward for UFCW Local 1994 McGeo, the union representing ride-on workers, of which he is also a member of their climate committee. And we are very fortunate that Clint is also a member of the Sierra Club Montgomery County's executive team committee and serves on the transportation committee. So that is our panel for today. We are really excited to have all these amazing people on our panel to talk about an, an issue that's really important to our community uh, and it impacts everyone, transit equity, because all of us need to commute and Sierra Club's priority is to make sure that public transportation is accessible to everyone. Tina is gonna talk about that later. Um, I also want to introduce one person that I did not yet introduce, which is Lindsay Mendelson. Lindsay is our staff lead at Sierra Club Maryland chapter uh, for transportation, and she is an amazing leader supporting uh, the Sierra Club um, Maryland groups and working and, uh, on the transportation issues with a priority on um, several uh, bills that are currently being heard in the legislative session in the General Assembly. Uh, so with that, why don't I uh, pass on to Tina to talk about what the Sierra Club priorities are on transit issues. 
Thank you very much, Shruti. Um, I'm Tina, Cha uh, Tina Slater, Chair of the uh, Montgomery County Sierra Club uh, Transit uh, Transportation. We have several uh, priorities. One of them is bus rapid transit BRT. We're thrilled that US 29 BRT flash opened up uh, last year. And um, we're, we're hoping to see more BRT corridors throughout the county. And we'd love to see the dedicated lane on US 29 BRT completed all the way from north to south on the on the corridor plus bus only lanes in other areas where possible. Um, another thing that we support is the Better Bus Campaign, which is ride ons restructuring and reimagining of the ride on routes, which haven't been re redesigned for quite some time. We're very supportive of that. We um, are big proponents of Vision Zero. Montgomery County is one of the first counties to take this on in the in the nation and make it a priority to reduce and eliminate severe and fatal collisions on our roadways. Um, another part of Vision Zero that's happening right now in the County Council is Evan Gla Council Member Evan Glass's bill, Shovel Our Sidewalks, which would um, ask the county to take care of shoveling even more sidewalks along highly trafficked bus routes. They take a good care of plowing the roads for the cars and buses. We also need the sidewalks cleared so people can access the bus stops. A huge priority for um, Montgomery County Sierra Club and Maryland Sierra Club is stopping the 274.95 widening Instead, we would like to invest in transit infrastructure, and we feel that teleworking may make a huge difference in how employees, especially federal employees, go back to work after COVID. And we're also interested in transportation demand management. Uh, once again, teleworking, um, and, and also the counties working with employers to try to get fewer people to drive solo to work. So those are our main priorities. Thank you, Shridi. Thank you, Tina. And uh, I also want to give an opportunity to Lindsay to quickly mention about the work Sierra Club Maryland is doing on transportation issues, especially since some of those priorities also affect Montgomery County. Lindsay? Yes, definitely. So um, one of the bills that we're working on with our allies is called the Transit Safety and Investment Act, um, SB 199 in the House and HB 114 in the House. And this bill is really important because right now the Maryland Transit Administration, which um, serves every single county um, in the state and um, and Baltimore City um, is facing a huge $2 billion maintenance backlog. Um, in fact, uh, Maryland is one of the worst states in the country in terms of breakdowns, both our commuter rail service, which serves Montgomery County, and also the light rail system, the bus system in greater Baltimore has one of the worst breakdown rates. Um, and this means that um, many folks, including essential workers, um, people with disabilities, students, can't actually get to the places that they need to go every day. And um, if we continue to defer the maintenance backlog, it's only going to grow and people are going to be able to um, have more trouble getting to really important places every day. And we also know that, um, you know, in a public health crisis and a climate crisis, we cannot afford to be um, cutting um, at all on our public transit service. So definitely encourage everyone to um, support the Transit Safety and Investment Act. And I'm gonna put in the chat um, a link to our coalition site, savemdtransit.org. Thank you so much, Lindsay. Uh, and before we move on to uh, Glenn, who I would like to invite to share some opening remarks as well. I want to mention that's one of Sierra Club's priority is not just addressing climate change, but also to address equity. And it is um, really trans transportation equity is uh, affects all working families because first of all, we want to make sure that we are encouraging public transportation to address greenhouse gas emissions and climate crisis. Having said that, we also want to make sure that because our goal is to reduce single occupancy vehicles that we are encouraging people to use public transportation. But many um, working families depend on public transportation 
And we can only make sure everyone is able to use public transportation or at least has the option to use public transportation if it is accessible, if it is affordable, and uh, looking at what kind of um, things might affect transit equity. Uh, people, uh, you know, it affects the jobs, it affects how people get to their workplace, but also, uh, you know, making sure that it's accessible from where people live. So it's, an, it's a very important topic to make sure that transit equity is something that we address uh, in the work that we do in our advocacy efforts. And so with that, I want to call on um, Clint Sobrati, who is a transit worker. And um, Clint, why don't you uh, share with us what experience you have with um, transportation in Montgomery County? Um, yeah, hi, good night, Julie, thanks. Um, first, I'd like to say thank you to all the panelists that came out, um, President Gina Wren from UFCW McGeo, his um, special assistant, Raymond Lee, who two of them, you know, I know for the past over 10 years and they have been very good, supportive and leaders and mentors that I learned a lot from over the course of my time with McGill. Also, I'd like to thank Director Chris Conklin for attending this meeting because, you know, we all work in this together. Um, Hannah Wren, Han Hannah Hen, I have never met you, but it's glad to meet you. And Ashanti Martinez, I'm, thank you for joining this meeting as well. Um, you know, I've been working with McGill for the past, I mean, been working with the county as a bus operator and now a transit coordinator for the past 10 years. And, you know, over the years, I, I witnessed a lot of stuff, um, the, the growth and the evolution that we're evolving slowly over the course of time that, you know, we're, we're doing a, is coming along good. But over the past year, you know, we, we witnessed some unprecedented times where we were challenged with the whole COVID and get into it, you know, we had a lot of operators and supervisors and coordinators who contracted and get ill to this um, situation. You know, a few of us was lucky enough not to even come close to getting any symptoms whatsoever because, you know, we have good leadership, not only from the management, but also from the union point of view that they work collectively together to put up safety guardrails that protects everyone. And, you know, we all, is have been working out fine because, you know, it's always been an open dialogue where everyone is trying their best to make sure everyone is safe. And, you know, we just try to find a way through, through these tough times that we're facing. Thank you. All right, with that, I would like to move on to our first uh, panelist, Mr. Conklin, and ask, uh, Chris, would you like to talk about MCDOT priorities and the work that MCDOT is doing in Montgomery County to address transit equity and health and safety of transit workers. I'd love to, and um, I really appreciate all the comments others have made here. Um, our priorities seem like they're your priorities, which is good. I'm sure there are individual issues or, or strategies that we might disagree with, but our top priorities are really um, around vision zero um, we have too many fatalities on our roads. We have made some progress on the vehicular crash side over the past years, but have seen some of that get eroded in the COVID situation where traffic speeds are so much higher than they are under our normal congested conditions. Um, and we, we have not made the progress necessarily that we'd like to make on uh, pedestrian and bicycle fatalities. And it's a very difficult challenge we're dealing with a set of infrastructure that's been developed largely between the 1950s and the 1980s that was designed with the goal to move people in their own cars long distances at high speeds. And that is not the county that we are trying to become, which is a county of, although separated, but urban clusters where people can walk, bike, and enjoy their life in a small radius of space and don't need to rely on their private car to travel long distances at high speeds. Um, we have been in transition uh, from one to the other for probably 15 years, but 15 years compared to 50 or 60, and the amount of investment that was made over that time is a very small period of time and we're trying to accelerate the work we can do on the engineering side uh, to change that infrastructure to be less hazardous to people who are walking and biking on it and trying to use our transit system. 
that's a big challenge and that's one of our top three priorities. A second priority is related climate. Um, if you've looked at the county's climate action plan, there are many, many strategies related to transportation. Some of those are related to that first issue I talked about, about moving towards an environment of connected communities where you're, you live and work in a community, but you're connected to others and you can move about that without an energy intensive transportation mode. And a component of that is transit. We know we're part of a large region uh, and to reduce our impact on the environment and our carbon emissions, we need to be able to move people more efficiently than we do today um, in internal combustion powered cars using highways to travel around the region. We've had some setbacks on that with COVID. You've probably heard the rhetoric about how COVID is making people choose to live further away, making people choose to drive cars for their trips. Um, in a meeting earlier today, we talked about, do you let the trends control your future or do you try to direct your future through your actions and strategies? Um, we are in the camp that we need to chart our own course to the future and not just let trends take us where they may. So we're staying focused on a strategy to invest in our transit network to make the connections between our communities uh, easier by transit, to make transit a competitive, if not desirable mode for people to make their trips. So they, you know, they say, gee, I could do this in my car, hopefully an electric car. We're gonna have cars for a long time. That's the way our community has been designed in past eras. And we're gonna, we're gonna live with that for a long time. But is transit a viable choice? Can I take the bus instead of my car? We want to do that. We're not going to have a rail system everywhere. This is going to be a bus system. So we're working to address that. And we also are working to address the energy use and type of fueling of our fleet. Um, this year, we rolled out the first four electric transit vehicles. They've been exceeding the department's expectations. We are notoriously conservative. Um, our first strategy is to make transit better and to get people to use it. Our second uh, strategy is to reduce the environmental impact of the transit we're providing. But that impact is very small in comparison to the impact from all the people traveling in their own cars. So we didn't want to compromise the service by changing the fuel type, but we've been seeing that those vehicles have been performing well. We've uh, developed a much stronger partnership with our Department of General Services that actually provides us our fleet and maintains that fleet. And they are looking to do a full microgrid facility at our Silver Spring Depot that can get us to about a third of that operation being electric vehicle. And that's the beginning. You've probably seen the announcement from Montgomery P County Public Schools about their program for leasing of electric school buses. That's frankly easier in, in the school transportation realm where the buses are all moving at certain times of the day and then all stationary at certain times of the day. It's a little harder in the public transit realm, but we are looking at that model for the transit fleet as well and hope to be able to get to all electric. Um, I shouldn't say all electric, all no emission by the target date of the Climate Action Plan 2035. Climate is also straining our infrastructure. It's not just about the operations, but we have a lot of um, infrastructure that was built in the 60s through the 80s for stormwater that isn't meeting the needs with the increased intensity of storms and is already degraded from its kind of reaching the end of its service life and perhaps some issues with its construction early on. Um, so figuring out how to make sure that our, our infrastructure can um, make it through the through the climate stresses that it's under is also an important element of that. And there's a lot of other actions in there about um, encouraging public adoption of electric vehicle fleets or zero emission fleets, about uh, transportation demand management and driving down the amount of travel that's required for us to you know, live our lives. Those are all components of that climate action plan. That's a second major priority area. The third is economic growth and development. Um, and you know, our, our population in this region is growing. Um, we need to have jobs. So we need to have an economy that supports the lifestyle that we're trying to encourage through our planning, those connected communities. 
We need to work hard to allow our business sector to recover. Uh, and we're focused on that. And we're focused on improving the way that we invest in new services and infrastructure so that we're an attractive place for people to be. I don't think we're trying to compete with the rest of the country on uh, some of the strategies that they've had. We're trying to build on the strengths that we have, uh, which is a, you know, a community that's um, focused on equity, focused on inclusion, focused on sustainability, focused on uh, a lifestyle that is um, not as impactful. Um, it, but we still need to make investments to make that happen. And we need to work on transforming our infrastructure to meet those needs and making sure the services we provide meet those needs. Now, all of that is in the lens of equity. And as uh, I think Clint talked about this a little bit in his remarks, as we started to experience the impacts of COVID, um, we had to adjust what we were doing. And the first thing that we did was to look at where do we have zero car households? Where do we have um, one car households? Where do we have lower incomes? Where do we have people that are most likely to be working in service and essential service jobs where they don't have a car to travel either to get to food, medicine, um, pharmacy, banking, or work. And we, we worked very hard to structure a response in our transit program that connected those communities to where those services were being provided. And it wasn't easy and it took a couple steps and then it took many steps to build out of that. Right now we're at about 80% of our normal service and it's really focused around where that ridership is occurring. Um, you know, it's interesting, our budget process normally goes, where are the low performing routes? Well, we have every route in service, but the service on those routes doesn't match the schedules that the budget was based on years ago. It's based on where we're seeing the ridership and trying to keep people able to maintain the social distance and make the essential trips. And what Clint talked about, I mean, we've, we've tried to limit the number of people on our vehicles, which is the opposite of what we normally try to do. Uh, we've tried to make sure that we have buses in reserve with operators that can respond in cases of overcrowding. And we've, we've worked hard to restore the service where the people are using the service and not just to hit headway marks on other routes. So um, that's important. You'll be seeing, I believe in the coming weeks, some um, more discussion of initiatives to get more reliable and predictable funding for transportation uh, services and infrastructure. Um, you know, there's been some challenges in how that is funded over the years through the development process and the adequate pu public facilities ordinance, impact taxes and fees. We're trying to figure out a solution that's more reliable and allows us to make the investments we need for our economy to be successful. We did a lot of short term strategic measures during COVID around streeteries, around open streets. I think we've talked about with you before, um, making those programs permanent, but then figuring out how to get our infrastructure to adapt to what we need for our economy to be what we want it to be in this county is a really a key priority for us. Thank you so much for sharing that uh, those details on the priorities. Without further ado, I want to call on Gino to talk about uh, you know, MacGeo's priorities. Good evening, everybody. Thank you uh, for allowing me the privilege of being part of this conversation this evening. Um, in terms of uh, the union's priorities in relationship to the Montgomery County transit system, but it probably exceeds that the, the metropolitan area transit system because we work closely with uh, our, our partners at uh, ATU 689 and we often collaborate on the needs of uh, of uh, transit enhancement uh, throughout the region. Um, we, um, I think we can all agree on, on this call that um, we share the same vision or the same goal of trying to mitigate as best we can the damage that we've inflicted on our environment. And I believe strongly that one of the uh, most significant things we can do in that regard is to expand and enhance uh, the national transit system. But here in Montgomery County, I, I want to say that uh, we enjoy 
a very strong relationship, uh, a very collaborative partnership with Chris and his team in terms of trying to assure that our transit system is the best that we can uh, build out at, that delivers the highest level of quality uh, as possible to, uh, to the community. Um, in terms of trying to uh, reduce the uh, county's carbon footprint, uh, very quickly in this last round of negotiations, we ne negotiated a joint labor management uh, committee that we have called the Work, Life and Green Initiative Subcommittee. And the uh, purpose of the group shall be to identify and analyze the feasibility of developing and implementing work, life and green initiatives to reduce the county's carbon footprint, which may include, and then it has a list of initiatives, but one of the primary um, um, ingredients to, to that uh, particular subcommittee or committee being successful is try to, as best we can, to get the largest number of our members off the roads during normal business hours. We're going to pursue that through an expansion of telecommuting uh, across the county, but we're also in conversations with uh, the department and the county executive of, of standing up uh, van pools for um, the county workforce, so they're not all driving individually into major uh, employment hubs. Uh, as far as transit's concerned, uh, the ride-on system specifically, uh, we we have a couple challenges ahead of us, and and these are absolute priorities. One of the uh, most uh, and important challenges, I believe, and and we we struggle with the management. Uh, on this issue on a, on a reoccurring basis. We are uh, trying to find ways, initiatives that we can enhance the safety and security of the system, not just for our operators, but for the riders and for the general public. Uh, we have far too many incidents of, of, uh, uh, of accidents. Um, we have far too many incidents of aggression against uh, our drivers and, and passengers while uh, the bus is, is in operation. And uh, we're focusing on trying to mitigate as much of that as possible. Um, another priority is to enhance the competitiveness of, of Montgomery County as employment, uh, transit employment. What I mean by that is uh, our number one competitor in terms of um, recruiting uh, our, our operators is the metro system. Uh, they have uh, a, 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 a much more capacity in terms of compensation and other like uh, benefits. And um, what we find ourselves more often than not is becoming a trainer of transit operators where the county uh, will uh, support, financially support candidates to uh, uh, secured our CDLs, uh, get some uh, uh, experience under their belts, and then they um, many more more often than we would like uh, run off to WMATA because over the same period of a career t a term of a career, their um, earning potential is far greater. And um, the good news is that we do have agreement with the executive to do a market analysis uh, on the bus operators and some other hard to retain and recruit uh, job classes in the county to line them up uh, better with, with the market. And we hope that that will help better stabilize uh, the workforce. Other things that are a priority are making sure that the equipment is the best that we can get. And I must say that Chris has made that an absolute priority, and um, the fleet has been uh, upgraded significantly. Uh, we still have some work to do, but I'm very confident and optimistic that we're going to continue to improve in that area. But along with that, we have to make sure our training of both the operators for the new technology that's found on these, these transit uh, uh, pieces of equipment um, and the maintenance of the equipment is the best that we can provide. And again, I'm confident that we'll be able to achieve that. All in all, um, 
our priority is to continue to partner uh, with the county executive, uh, Chris and his team, to continue to expand and build out the transit system uh, for the people that need it the most, uh, but also make sure that it's it's convenient, that it's safe, and it's a desirable option uh, that will lure people out of their vehicles. Thank you, Gino. Um, I know that we also have, um, I want to see if uh, Raymond, you would like to add any comments? Gino pretty much covered it. Uh, I have nothing to add. You can actually pass it to Ashanti. Uh, okay, a, great, far Ashanti. Far better job than I expected. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Ashanti, tell us about CASA's priorities and what work CASA is doing on transit equity. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, I'm Ashanti Martinez from CASA. Um, at CASA, we are an organization that represents the interest of working class uh, immigrants. Here in Montgomery County, we have about 20,000 plus members part of our organization. And I have the pleasure of representing uh, their interest at the council level. Um, for us, transit equity is extremely important and something that I'm continuing to bring up in conversations and fight for for our members. Uh, for us, the completion of the Purple Line, um, including first and last mile connectivity is extremely important. We wanna make sure that once that transit opportunity is available, it's available for everyone in the community to have access. Um, and that includes our members. Um, another priority for us is the MoCo Better Buses campaign. We are one of many organizations signed on to support a restructuring of Ride On because we know the needs of the community. We understand how transit can benefit folks, but we also understand how transit can be a hurdle and a hindrance to people's success. And so we signed on to that campaign because we support the initiatives listed. And I'm sure we'll jump into more discussion about that as well. Um, and the, I guess the last priority for us is just to make sure that our members' voices are at every transit conversation that they can be. Uh, part of what I do is to make sure that their voices are not left out and making sure that they're at every single table um, is important. We wanna make sure that the immigrant voice, the working class voice is at the table when we do our transit planning so that we understand their pain points and can better come to solutions um, at the front end instead of trying to work at the back end to fix problems. Thank you so much, Ashanti. Um, I know we have Samuel Jordan who joined us. Uh, Samuel, would you like to introduce yourself and tell us about the work you are doing on transit equity? Yes, thank you. Can you hear me now? Yes. Good evening. I am Samuel Jordan. Glad to join you in this discussion. I'm president of the Baltimore Transit Equity Coalition. I could say the embattled Baltimore Transit Equity Coalition. Uh, equity in transportation policy uh, is relatively, uh, in, it was in great need here in Baltimore. And I do understand having grown up in Washington DC, you know, before Metro, how that developed along lines that were also sort of controversial, you know, the red line first and another 20 years or so before we get a, a blue and green line. Another question altogether I want to discuss first how we sort of radiate our issues and concerns about transit equity from Baltimore and outward. In the Baltimore region, and several of you I'm sure are familiar with Baltimore, 100% of the jobs in the region can be reached by car within an hour. Only 9% of the jobs in the region can be reached by public transportation in an hour. And, and that sort of captures where we begin with a discussion on transit equity. But we sort of go a little further since you're familiar with uh, the way Governor Hogan has treated us with the red line compared to what he's done with the purple line. It's still a sore, sore issue because what we saw was a continuation of Baltimore's race-based transportation policy. It's not a few years old, it's a couple of centuries old and uh, it predates redlining as a matter of fact. And uh, we haven't sort of rid ourselves of that uh, curse. So the function and primary mission of the Baltimore Transit Equity Coalition is to build and lead an informed, resolute, 
regional constituency that will demand and pursue the completion of the red line light rail project. And we're doing that not just because we want to make sure we have an east-west 14.2 mile 19 station uh, connection with uh, rapid transit, rail transit, but because we foresee the red line as a major installment, perhaps the first major installment in the build out of an equitable, reliable transportation system for central Maryland. Uh, for that, seeing our campaign and mission, we need a vehicle and we've studied this. I've been a volunteer planner on the red line for nine years and um, before it was canceled by the governor and we learned all over the country, Seattle, P uh, Portland, Denver, Boston, Charlotte, wherever that a regional transportation authority will be our most pragmatic path toward completing the red line. And for that reason, we see that as frankly, uh, a response to structural racism in MDOT MTA. I'm not sure how your experiences have been recently, but we do see what the governor is doing with this uh, uh, dedication to toll roads and uh, for the toll roads in both directions, I-270 and uh, 495. That's an issue that you're dealing with, but it's also very important to us because it has changed and it dominates the character of investments in public transportation in the Baltimore region. So I wanna just uh, give a quick summary of uh, a legislative initiative that we have underway that will impact and will affect everybody. And we hope you can uh, see a way of helping us make this uh, uh, become law in the state of Maryland. That is HB 1204. Its formal name is the Transportation Equity Analyses, Plural, and Assurances Act of 2021. What it is basically, and I think there may be three major issues to describe, it actually codifies the Title VI protections in transportation at the state level. You might be surprised to know that there are no states or major regions in the country that actually codify the Title VI protections. Title VI is federally enforced, and as such, M.MTA has dismissed it altogether. One of the major uh, uh, provisions of the Act, uh, our bill, is to require prior transit analyses before any major transit decisions are proposed and certainly before they are imposed. And that prior transit analysis is a fundamental requirement of Title VI. What it requires is that a prior analysis be made on the impacts of the communities most directly affected by the proposed change. Title VI also requires a cost benefit analysis, consultation with the members and leaders of the communities most directly affected, and the offer of uh, alternatives less egregious than the proposal. But there has been no such uh, prior analysis in five years in Baltimore. And that is a mandate of Title VI. Wherever there is a transportation system with $1 federal funds, there is to be compliance and promotion of compliance with Title VI. We don't have it. So HB 1204 is our attempt to codify and make transit equity a matter of Maryland state law. Other two uh, issues besides the prior analyses and uh, <clears throat> studies, it also requires cross-modal analyses. That is, in September 1, when M.MTA proposed very draconian cuts in service, uh, 12 lines just simply reduced, that is, length and headways, but 25 cut completely, 20% cut in the core bus service, which is 83% Black. Very modest cuts are proposed for, for example, commuter rail, 4 to 8% with a 76% white ridership. So you can see that there was a focus here on the cuts actually being made in MTA. But MTA is only one modal division of the Department of Transportation. In fact, MTA gets 2% of the budget. State highways get 77%. But there were no cuts proposed for the ports, the, the airport, the seaport, or highways and roads. All that, but if you only look at core bus service in MTA, 
you get a distorted view of what the real picture is with respect to equity in transit budgeting and expenditures, programs and policies. So cross-modal analyses is required by our bill, HB 1204. Prior analyses is required. It also creates a commission, a commission on transit equity. And I think this is something that uh, may uh, be a very important, a uh, great importance to uh, communities all over the state. That is any modal division, any transportation decision or policy can be subject to a transit equity analysis. Uh, I wanna make that a very important issue or feature of the bill because we need your help. M.MTA did not, they, we had a hearing on Thursday, the 11th. There was no opposition, uh, almost rare, but no opposition. It was well-regarded, well-respected, a lot of support. M.MTA did not even oppose it. What they did do instead was manipulate the fiscal note for the bill. So we have a fiscal note of $4.3 million for the startup on a commission. Uh, we challenge it, of course, and we think it's excessive, but that's a way to kill a bill that the agency doesn't really want to see the light of day. Uh, I'm sure you've experienced this, those of you who have experience with uh, the legislative process. You know, assault by uh, fiscal note is not new, but that's where we are, and we need your help. We'll talk about it further. We'll have uh, the organizers of the webinar uh, circulate some of the uh, information, but I want to just mention these two things and, and run quickly. Do I have maybe, I'm not sure of the time, I think we're giving about two or three minutes for each speaker and I've done that already. Yeah, no, thank you so much. We really appreciate that time and we're going to come around for more comments. I think yes. Tina has a question. Uh, so Tina. Oh, um, thank you very much. My question, um, Actually, I had two questions, if I could pose them both to uh, Director Conklin. Yeah. Um, first of all, I liked your phrase when you were speaking where you said, I, do we let trends control our future? I thought that was a great quote. And maybe you can give a couple examples of that. And then my second question is different. How is the county executive's budget, how, how will the budget cuts affect um, MC uh, DOT? Sure, so for the first one, Tina, um, you know, life is full of controllable and uncontrollable events, right? And they both affect us. We, we, we can't control what we can't control. So it came upon us, it's a reality, we deal with it. The response has been, um, I don't want to use transit. There's really no evidence that riding transit has been terribly unsafe through this. There's been Herculean efforts to maintain the safety of transit. Um, but nonetheless, um, we're traveling less. When we travel, it's more discretionary. And we choose what's most convenient and feels safest to us in, the, in that time frame. But what we're talking about here is a long-term strategy for the county. And we can't let the choices of convenience or even your own safety in the immediate time in, in 2019 and 2020 dictate where we go as a county for 20 plus years. So yes, these trends are occurring this is what we're experiencing, but that to predict our future. We have to keep our policy and planning um, skills intact and say, we're dealing with this now, this is reality now, this doesn't ma mean that this is the way it will always be. We would like to have a community that looks like something else or even looks like the community that we have. So therefore we need to be deliberate in charting our culture our, our future in light of the events that we're experiencing now. So that's kind of what I, I meant by that first quote. Um, your second question, I've already forgotten. <laughs> okay, um, with the budget cuts that the county executive is proposing, how will it affect you? Yeah, our budget has been reduced by about $6 million out of 
around $250 million, which is, doesn't sound like a lot, but um, it is significant. And we've been fortunate that a lot of that is realized through operational savings on expenses we haven't had. Um, for example, the Kids Ride Free program is a great program, um, but there haven't been that many kids riding and we pay WMATA when kids ride WMATA services. So um, we've been able to realize savings on that. We've been able to realize savings on fuel and maintenance of the transit fleet. So we're, we're making up a good portion of that savings through things that aren't really an impact to services. There are some which are, you know, it's not what we'd like to see, but they're real. Things like the fair share program, which I'm not sure if you're familiar with that, but it's a program where um, we match employer incentives for transit pass purchase. We haven't seen a lot of transit pass purchases being occurred in 2020 um, because people aren't commuting. So what we've done is set a funding level that allows that program to be maintained, but not expanded in this coming fiscal year. Um, so we've tried to make up most of the savings through those types of measures and also keeping some uh, vacant positions on Build, we call it um, a personnel cost savings, um, delaying hiring to fill positions. Um, so I don't think there's a lot of direct service impacts from the savings in the budget. And we've tried hard to make sure that we've you know, cut the things that we can cut and kept critical things in place. Um, the transit budget was cut also, um, but right now we're at 80% transit operation compared to normal scale. Schedule. We're trying to get to 93% by the end of the fiscal year, uh, and then hoping uh, in the next fiscal year to get back to the level of service that we had before. And um, we haven't talked about it yet, but we have that right on restructuring um, yeah. study in place. And we're, this is actually a really good, good opportunity for that because there's been a disruption to the normal schedule. So mm -hmm. uh, this provides a good window for us to say, now that we're not doing what we were always doing, what should we be doing instead? So I, I'm, I'm hopeful for that study, although it will likely last longer than this fiscal year that the budget covers. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Tina. There is one question in the chat from, uh, actually two questions, but we'll take them one at a time. One from Debbie uh, about HB 1204. Where is the Montgomery County delegation and do any specific delegates need to hear from constituents? So Lindsay, who's on the committee? And then Samuel, you might have some more information to add to that. Yeah, so in terms of the Montgomery County representatives on the Environment Transport and Transportation Committee, it'd be Chairman um, Barve, Delegate Fraser Hidalgo, Delegate Jim Gil Gilchrist, Delegate Sarah Love, and Delegate Von Stewart. And if you're interested in seeing if um, who your elected officials are, you can go to mdelect.net. And if any of them that I mentioned are your representative, it would be great for you to contact them. I and mean, I'll also put this in the chat. Thank you, Lindsay. We definitely want people to reach out to the, their delegation in the district that they live in. And I know that Sierra Club Maryland is sending out emails to everybody uh, as a follow up to what people can do to support the legislation that is in session right now. Samuel, did you want to add more information? Yes, on yes thank you. Uh, Fraser Dalgo and uh, De uh, Delegate Fraser Dalgo and uh, Stewart, Vaughn Stewart, are advocates and, and are very supportive. Uh, but and, and for that, we, we sort of want you to help us uh, put a little pressure on uh, Chairman Barley. Uh, we do need some intervention with M.MTA to uh, reduce in some way this uh, fiscal note. You see, if, if we can't manage this issue here in the next session, the current fiscal note will simply be a baseline and maybe even inflation will make it even higher. But we need to break this uh, barrier on the fiscal note. One, there's no opposition to the bill. So that's one thing about the uh, Montgomery County delegation as well. There's no opposition to the bill. And in fact, it can be seen as a kind of intersectional piece, uh, not only for the modes of transportation, that is any mode any service, any policy can be subject to a transit and equity analysis. 
And if they don't meet the standards of the commission created by the act or by this bill, HB 1204, the policy can be imposed. So it's better than the traditional uh, penalties that are used to uh, uh, impose, that is some financial penalty. We're not trying to reduce uh, investments in public transportation, but we do want these standards upheld. So we want some pressure on uh, Chairman Barve, uh, Chairman McIntosh, Speaker Jones to get some relief from MDOT. You see DLS makes up its uh, uh, fiscal note based on discussions with the agency involved. So if the agency doesn't support the bill, then they manipulate the fiscal note. But that isn't all there is to it. We wanna make sure that what we're faced is, is sort of clearly understood. You see, equity is a, is a $9 billion a year business already. You know, there's equity in cookbooks now. What we're saying is, let's not mistake what we're doing here. Public transportation is racially conflicted wherever people of color live in this country, and there's no exception. We're fighting racism. I like the idea of equity and being treated fairly, but I also like the idea better of let's eliminate racism from public policy. So we want support for it. We know we have to do a lot of uh, education around the state on this issue, how to frame it and what we're doing. But you can keep this in mind, of course, where there's no real emphasis on, on uh, transit equity and eliminating structural racism from transportation, we get sprawl. We get autocentrism where there's a more respect for transit equity and the fact that more people really want to use transit than drive their cars a lot more than we even know uh, and have calibrated, we can make it, make more efficient and strategic use of density. That village that was spoken of earlier, you know, uh, having a walkable, livable, uh, green space and so on in an in a area that might be dominated by a transit hub, more of a village type. Well, that's more of a life that we'd rather live, particularly when we note the intersection that MDOT MTA has not done between public transportation, the environment, public health, housing, healthcare, and employment. And last point I wanna make is that we are also engaged in a project with Johns Hopkins for cleansing techniques, methodologies, and materials on the fleet. We have had several occasions, several appointments with MDOT-MTA to see what they do. Each time they have not shown us what they spoke about and what we requested. What are the methods being used? How do we protect transit workers? Not only the essential workers and transit riders who are dependent upon the service, but we want to make sure that this becomes a, a center for increased investments the pandemic has proven to be an excuse for so many cities around the country and states to reduce investments in uh, public transportation. Of course, they say, well, ridership is down. But we also have this issue of shock doctrine that we see more of in the Baltimore region, perhaps, than you do see here. And that is taking advantage of the pandemic to reduce investments in public transportation or to raise the specter of disease on public transit when no studies have shown more than four or five percent of COVID being any way related to public transportation. Home is the best place to catch the virus. But we need support. You ask about the Montgomery uh, delegation. We need their support, but we also want to put pressure on Chairman Barve uh, to help us get some relief from this uh, kill the bill fiscal note. Thank you, Sam. Dina, I think you had a question for Clint. Yes, thank you. Um, Clint, you told me something once that I had no idea about. And you, you were talking about conflicts or interactions between bus drivers and riders. And you were referring to things pre-pandemic and then also what's going on during during the pandemic, and I wasn't even aware that this was an issue, but you but you were um, telling me about that. I thought maybe you could share. Yeah, um, yeah. Um, what it was that we faced, and uh, Chris was talking a little bit about it earlier, but pre, pre the COVID time, one of our biggest struggles as bus operators we had with the public is always a fair dispute, where most of the time, just because of lack of adequate funding, passengers will 
you know, get a little agitated and then they will verbally abuse or sometimes physically abuse drivers. And because of, they don't have no, the, the laws what's on the books right now is not, in, is not really a penalty of something that really puts them in a position where they'll think twice about actually assaulting a driver. That they, we tend to have a lot of um, drivers who was being assaulted over the years. Now, as we go through the whole COVID, the problem we having again now is, and it's few of it now, but is the asking the passenger to mask up, wearing of the mask. They're really now being refusal to put it on. And most of the time now, as me being a transit coordinator, we have to go out and ask them, you know, the, um, the department supplies so much mass. They give us so much mass. So most of the coordinators have at least 20 to 30 masses in the car. So we go to the bus, we try to give them and tell them wear it. But, you know, some, some, some days are better than some in a better term, but we're still facing a struggle. And most of the time we have to call um, Montgomery County police to come and assist with getting them off the bus because, you know, for some reason it's, it's been a struggle for them to put, wear the mask and, you know, the operators them, you know, they risk their life and the challenge with coming to work every day because I don't know if everyone know, but from the minute the COVID start, we're one of the few departments that stay operational throughout this whole COVID pandemic. We always been on the road. We're the first, 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 first um, employees on the road and the last on the road every single day, uh, 365, 366 days of a year. And, you know, we're the one that gets kind of um, the short end of the stick majority of the time when it comes to the public engagement and how the drivers are being treated with in regards to the mass. And, you know, well, now we, the, the fair dispute part has went down because, you know, a great decision of not having fair at the meantime is, it was a good, it was a good call on behalf of both management and union to work together on that. But now we face with the mass ch challenge. So one door closed, the next one open. Thank you very much. So, thank you, Clint. And I would like to ask if Gino or Raymond have anything to add from the McGeo perspective of the challenges that you've seen during pandemic times related to what uh, Clint just mentioned and what McGeo might be doing to address them or what are some of the challenges that you have seen in addressing these kind of um, situations? Well, um... I spent a lot of time in the depots and during the pandemic, um, there's been a lot of frustration, both on the operator's part and also the public, you know. It's difficult enough um, trying to go about life as we know it under the current circumstances. And being a bus operator for the most part, it's a thankless job, you know. A lot of times passengers don't remember the days that you show up on time. They remember the one time where the bus didn't show or when the bus was supposed to be there and the bus before them broke down, you know, and the, and the operators take a lot of that. But during the pandemic, you have, you have a lot of bus operators that are afraid, as most of us are, you know, so the wearing of the mask has caused some problems. Um, I think that the public has adjusted for the most part. Um, I would like to thank the department and the director for securing those barriers. Those plexiglass barriers were very important in to making the operators feel more safe and more comfortable. And throughout the entire pandemic, this the collaboration between the union and the department, ensuring that the operators are safe making sure that we deliver the services that we have promised to the public and to temper everyone's expectations and try to manage the frustrations, not just of the operators, but of the, of, of the passengers as well. It's been a challenge, um, but I can go on record and say this, when it comes to our response to COVID, the department's response to COVID, the union's response to COVID, I think as far as transportation, Montgomery County led the way. Um, we, we were the first to do rear door entry. We were the first to suspend fare. Um, our operators had hand sanitizers, wipes, and everything that they needed. Um, 
The hazard pay was very helpful. Um, the real time information, getting it out to the public as we adjust service. Um, as we ramped service back up, we did it in a way that was responsible and, and also met the needs of the public. Um, but yeah, I, I don't wanna, I can go all day, but I'm, I'm just so proud of the job that we did in collaboration, working with the county. And also to speak to what Clint said, it's been frustrating for everyone, but um, we can finally see the light at the end of the tunnel. Thank you for sharing that, Raymond. I think that's a very important point that you make. We, you know, it's been a challenging time for everyone, but uh, certainly a shout out to Montgomery County and the work that everyone has done around addressing these issues and doing the best we can during this time. There's always going to be challenges and we can, um, we will continue to work together on that. I see Chris Conklin has his hand up. So Chris, go for it. Yeah, I, I'm just responding to what Raymond said because the um, actually the hardest that I've had as director is the day that I learned we were going to have a mask mandate on our buses, which we're not Texas had that a year and a half ago or a year ago. It was probably April of last year, and they said you're going to have to have a mask on to ride the bus. And I said our most significant issue is the safety of our operators when they're trying to enforce the rules of riding the bus. And this is a pretty personal rule, um, you know, and now the health benefits of that are obvious, but at the time we had just come off of six weeks of being told not to wear masks. Um, I don't know why that was being told, but that was the story at the time. So what Raymond said is really important. I mean, we, we weighed very carefully this inconclusive evidence about the, the health benefits of this against the safety of our operators. And we decided in the end to require the mask wearing. And that was um, met with providing masks when they weren't readily available. And yes, there were issues with whether they were always on the bus or not. Um, but we worked really hard with our colleagues at McGeo to preserve the safety of the workers because without the workers, we have no service. Without the service, we're not serving the public. And this is the model that we've employed is that if our workers aren't protected and our, our workers aren't able to do their job effectively, then we're not delivering what we need to to the public. Um, and this was a real test of that because we had come off many years of incidents with fair enforcement and issues with driver assaults. And now we were upping the ante telling the drivers that they had to mandate a public health measure on the vehicle and I was petrified that we were gonna have serious issues, um, driver assaults and other negative outcomes of this. But, you know, thankfully our workers responded and our community responded, and it wasn't nearly as significant as my fears were at the time. So I just, just wanted to speak to that while Raymond was talking. No, well, thank you so much for sharing that, much appreciated. And um, Ashanti, I also have a question for you from the CASA perspective. What are the challenges that you have seen with, that working families may have seen during this time and what is CASA doing to support those families but also address these issues on uh, transit equity? We just talked about masks here and I know that, you know, uh, that's one of the, uh, you know, the families getting vaccinations and having access to all those resources is also one of the challenges that does affect transit equity. So would you like to add some information on that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, throughout the pandemic, a lot of our members have been extremely impacted uh, from loss of jobs to uh, lack of opportunities. A lot of folks um, have been uh, really having a tough time finding employment. Um, many live in multi-generational households uh, with mixed immigration status that oftentimes adds to a lot more uh, fear and um, reluctancy to work with government partners. So CASA has been a vital part in making sure that folks get, whether it's access to food because they have food insecurities, whether it's getting them access to healthcare, like testing, setting up testing facilities, doing the contact tracing in our communities, because we have the cultural, cultural competency to understand how to connect with these communities um, has been extremely vital. Uh, working with our government partners to make sure in the vaccine conversations, we define essential worker to fit the work that our members do has been really important. 
making sure that they understand the importance of having mobile vaccination sites and advocating for those resources to be allocated there. Um, but then in transit, making sure that we continue to have conversations with the council and the county executive's office about why free fares has made such a difference in the, our members' lives throughout this pandemic and ensuring that some level of free fares is, is in place uh, moving forward with our buses so that these folks can continue to ride and not have to worry about where the cost is going to come from uh, makes a difference in, in these folks' lives. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. And I'm so glad you touched on the free fair thing, because I also know one of the things that um, came to mind as you were talking about that is how it affects youth. And I know that right now, even though uh, schools are all virtual and students have been getting education online, there are with working families and many students in high school who also work after schools in general, and they have to use public transportation. So, you know, that's another aspect of public transit when we talk about you know, transit workers, working families, but also how it impacts youth learning and youth who are working to support their families. It's really important that we keep those things in mind. And these are all issues that are in connect, interconnected in terms of making sure that they have access to resources and the support that they need to make sure people are not losing their jobs and they can continue to um, you know, support their family as well as ensure health and safety of families. Um, so thank you. I really appreciate you sharing that. I know there was a question in the chat that I do want to uh, ask. It's related to the purple line. Uh, what will it take to get a separate corridor in Bethesda for the Crescent Trail instead of single tracking the purple line near the Bethesda metro station? Uh, Chris, I think that's a question for you. Yeah. Uh Unfortunately, I don't have all the answers to this question. Um, you know, the, there's been a plan that's been developed that has a separate tunnel through a recently completed development project that would then go under Maryland 355 and under Elm Street in daylight in the park to connect to the Capitol Crescent Trail. Um, when that project was added to the capital program, it was thought that it was around a 15 to $20 million project. It's turned out to be more like a 55 plus million dollar project. So the county executive has, has asked the Maryland Transit Administration as part of their re-procurement of the Purple Line contract, construction design build contract, to look at whether the head bike facility could be fit into the existing tunnel that's under 355. We don't have that answer now. We hope to have that answer for this summer. Um, that tunnel, that that facility through the existing tunnel won't be free, but we don't know the cost, and we don't know whether or not it would have an operational impact on the Purple Line. Um, so we're waiting for those results um, to understand whether that's possible or not. The strategy, if you were to do that, is that it's a temporary solution. By temporary, I mean ten to fifteen year solution. If the ridership on the purple line grows to the point where the greater headways are needed, there's really nothing that's going to occur that's going to prevent the tunnel through the, uh, I'll call it the apex building under 355 and into the Elm Street Park from happening. Um, it's all in public space and the por portion through the building is built. Um, so it could be installed later if it's needed to accommodate increased ridership and headway on the purple line. So right now it just, uh, the recommendation was to not fund construction of that separate tunnel until we know whether or not it could be accommodated in the existing tunnel. And, and by the way, we are building a surface route um, between the intersection of Woodmont Avenue and Bethesda Avenue to that same park where this tunnel will daylight. It has a fully protected crossing of Wisconsin Avenue so we will have a bikeable route through Bethesda either way. Um, but that's that's the short answer to that question. I could get into a lot of detail, I suppose, but it probably doesn't benefit anybody. Well, thank you, Chris, for sharing that. And I also want to recognize one of our attendees today, uh, Elizabeth Bunn, who is from the uh, Labor for Sustainability. And I think that Elizabeth has a question one of which is how much money will the county get from the American Rescue Plan? 
I think the, there were um, updates that were just published to our congressional representatives for this. Um, so I, I don't wanna be the source, but if you look back to the source documents, I believe it was 208 million to Montgomery County directly in additional money to the incorporated municipalities within the county in additional money re related to transit that I don't think we know the amount of yet. The transit funding through COVID has been interesting through these reliefs. Um, the money flows both to the state of Maryland and to the Washington region. And then the Washington region divides up its pot of money uh, among all the transit providers in the Washington region. And we, you know, we don't like to argue with our colleagues in other places, but we had to argue to get Montgomery County's fair share of that with the first CARES Act bill. And then that same formula translated to the bill that was signed at the end of um, 2020. Uh, so there's another tranche of aid that hasn't been delivered. And then there'll be another tranche with the Re Relief Act, but we don't yet know the amount that we would get. We would suspect that we get about, um, about a, I'm not sure I have the math right. We got um, 25 million in the first bill. We're, we're expecting about the same in the second and maybe a little bit more in the third. Thank you, Chris. And I also want to hear on this from McGeo or Casa if they want to talk about it. But while they might be thinking of this answer, let me ask another question from Elizabeth on how the has the county tried to include incentives for quality jobs in its procurement for zero emissions buses. For example, the buses that MCPS is leasing will be made by workers represented by UAW. Yeah, unfortunately, we're not the lead in the procurement on the vehicles. We give um, performance requirements, but our Department of General Services leads on the other right. element of procurements. They were, they're all Buy America vehicles. So um, um, I, I'm not sure exactly where the Proterra buses are manufactured or whether they're union labor or not. Uh, the next version of that, that procurement's underway. So it, it may or may not be the same vendor, I'm not sure. Thank you, Gino or Raymond, would you like to add anything to any of these comments or questions that were asked? On the, on the uh, last question that was asked, it's my understanding of procurement rules, they can't specify that any particular workforce that is producing anything has to be union. Um, I wish that that wasn't the case, but we're, we go up against that quite often. Um, Ashanti, do you have anything to add on these questions? No, um, not necessarily. I, I don't know the full amount the county is going to be getting from the American Rescue Plan, um, but we look forward to discussing with the county how they're going to spend it. So. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, well, you know, the, the, one of the questions that came up in terms of uh, incentives for quality job made me think about recruitment and retention of transit workers. And I was just wondering, um, if, uh, you know, Chris and even for the other people on the panel to talk about, have you seen challenges? Has the pandemic created challenges in terms of recruitment and retention of transit workers? And from the perspective of other organizations, um, what the county could be doing better or just anything that you all would like to share? Starting with Chris. Yeah, um, there's no question there's been challenges. I mean, we've had a lot of budget uncertainty. So our ability to hire has been affected by that. And I think that's the right decision. And we are not at 100% of service right now. And um, we need to hire the drivers when we need the drivers, not ahead of the time. So um, that's just the reality of what we've been through. Um, but nonetheless, we need to have the workforce we need to deliver the service at the level we're budgeted at. And we've had a lot of conversation with um, the county executive and our office of management and budget about when we need to resume our hiring and training in order to meet the service level that's been promised and that's well communicated. So I'm hopeful that will happen. Um, the retention components, a different question. And um, Gino and I have had conversation about this. 
the real challenge, and Raymond mentioned this too, is that driving a transit vehicle is a very challenging job. And a lot of times our employees who are our bus operators and who are doing the service may not feel appreciated for this work because it's hard work, it's scheduled work, it's every day, regardless of how you feel, regardless of how productive you wanna be, you gotta put in the time. And I've been working hard with our management team to impress upon them, to engage with our workforce and partners in delivering service to the public, that a happy and engaged and safe workforce is the workforce that will deliver the service, that will feel committed to the work that will be with the organization. And I'm hopeful that we make progress on this, um, but there's no question that we've had challenges before in recruiting and retaining our employees and COVID has not made this easier. Um, but I, I welcome the comments from Ray, uh, Ray and Gino on this. Yeah, I, it, COVID's made it difficult across the board, but particularly in transit uh, because of the nature of the, of the work. Uh, most folks do not realize the, the stress and the pressure and the challenges that our, our bus, any transit operator is faced with on a daily basis. Uh, you never know who's coming on the bus and you never know what they're bringing with them. And um, in terms of recruitment and retention, obviously wages, uh, the wage issue is, is very important. And as I said earlier, the parties have agreed to uh, get in the weeds on that and see how we can enhance that as best we can. But wages alone is not the only thing that keeps employees uh, employed with a particular employer. The treatment of, of the drivers is, is something that Raymond and, and Chris and, and Amo and, and myself have had a lot of conversation about. Um, I, and, and Chris has no ownership of this. And Rideon has not always done the best in that regard in terms of how it treats its drivers, its operators. And um, there's been a, a lack of collaboration. There's been a lack of what I consider to be proactive management of that particular workforce. Now, Chris is committed uh, to, to, to change that. And I must say that we're making good progress in that regard. But look, public employment, people don't go into public employment because they're going to get rich. We all realize that. It's a calling, and most people do it because it's a good job. Don't deny that. But they get personal and professional gratification of serving their community. And I don't think public employers appreciate that dynamic of the employment relationship. And Montgomery County is not unique. We have this problem with all our government employers that we have to find ways to reward those employees better and more frequently. We just haven't found that perfect formula yet, but we're going to continue to work together until we do. It's important. And thank you so much for sharing that. And, you know, I can say that as a resident of Montgomery County that I greatly appreciate our transit workers and all frontline workers who have been there despite these challenges of COVID-19. And everyone's work comes with a lot of challenges. And we as advocates are certainly advocating. I know that Sierra Club Maryland worked with um, Ask Me or, uh, last year to advocate for transit workers. And we continue to do that because we want to make sure that, you know, we are um, on the front line of these issues that are important to our community. So thank you for sharing that. We are at 8.22 and we just have about eight minutes. But so I want to go around and ask the panelists a question or for you to be able to give some remarks on these issues. I know this is a broad topic, but um, one of the things we were talking about is uh, Tina and I and our team was talking about earlier had to do with the Better Buses campaign. And every time I say that, I feel like I end up saying butter, butter, but <laughs> it's a Better Buses campaign. And, um, you know, we have such a big county. Transit equity means making sure everybody has access to public transportation. 
And in a county like Montgomery County, that certainly comes with its own challenges. Mm -hmm. And then on top of that, we are dealing with the pandemic situation and we are dealing with lack of resources and there is never enough funding we can get into metros and WMATA and all kinds of things. And I just want all of you to uh, briefly talk about uh, how we all, whether it's the county, whether it is uh, grassroots uh, advocacy that we are doing on this issue, how can we all do better in addressing this issue of transit equity? So Chris, why don't we start with you? Yeah, thank you for that. It's, um, you, you phrased it well, it's a complicated topic. There are really a few elements to this. One is the long-term vision for the county which is really the BRT program, which is having high quality transit to a much broader segment um, or geography of the county to take advantage of it. Um, those investments are expensive, so we can't necessarily wait for all of that to be available. So what can we do in the interim? How can we improve on what we're doing you know, in the next five years? And we're developing ideas for that things like the, um, the Life Sciences Connector program that we've been rolling out um, recently that are you know, smaller scale investments that fit better into the capital program that are sustainable operationally. We need to do that work and we need to get those services out there. And yes, the quarter city transit way is the long-term transit vision. But until we have that vision, what is it that we're doing so that we're not setting up an auto-centric development pattern and dynamic now? How are we providing understandable, reliable, accessible service now? We have to do both. And then the other component of this is the county is not cheap when it comes to transit. We're spending, you know, 150 plus million dollars a year operating our ride-on system. How do we make sure we're getting every ounce of value out of that investment? And part of that is what I talked about a minute ago sure that our employees know that they're delivering services the community needs. And the other is those decisions have been made on that system structure over decades. And, and we should at least spend a small portion of what we spend every year operating that system to make sure that that system is being done as effectively as it can. So that's what that means. So when you look at it, there's, you know, what are we looking at in 10 to 20 years? That's the BRT network. That's the capital investment. That's a different type of service. That's bringing, you know, high quality, reliable transit to more of the county every day. What are we doing until that's available? We're making services that are easier to use, easier to understand, more reliable. What are we doing with everything else? We're making sure we're getting all the value we can out of the money we're spending. Um, and making sure that the people who are providing that service feel valued and respected and know that they're delivering service to public needs. So that's kind of how I see it. There's a lot of pieces to this and the Metro component makes it more complicated um, because if, if we were the only provider, then we could make decisions countywide, but we're not. Um, and the service is not uniformly distributed geographically. So we have to work very closely with our partners at WMATA to make sure that we're not creating more inequities by doing something different with ride-on service that is happening with WMATA service. And in the pandemic time, um, that's been even more challenged based on the kind of more dire financial position WMATA has been on based on user-based revenue than the county, which was largely tax supported. Thank you, Chris. Uh, Gino, from McGeo's perspective, what would you say? Well, I, I think yeah, I, I remember the days when right on just started that that how far back I go 44 years and we literally started off with used vehicles and the vision was not what it is today. I mean, we we just exceeded anybody's expectation in the build out of this transit system. I think, unfortunately, we probably haven't given it as much strategic design as it required consistent with the growth of our community but also with the significant change in the demographics of the individuals that rely on transit uh, there was a time when it was a nice option to have 
But now we have tens and thousands of workers that uh, serve the needs of our community who that's their primary form of transportation. Um, those workers tend to be uh, your forgotten political voices, quite frankly. And um, we need to make sure that as we continue to build out, that we're building out the needs of the people that rely on the service the most, the folks that can't afford the vehicles, their private vehicles, the people that have to get to work at odd hours of the morning. I think if, if we make that a priority, not just simply moving people from A to B, meeting the need of the people that depend on the service, I think we'll do a better job of building out a more equitable system. Thank you for that, Gino. Um, let me just quickly go around. Ray, do you have any closing comments? And then Ashanti. Uh, just to double down on what Chris said and what Gino said, I think that we cannot be afraid to lead. You know, this system has outgrown its expectations, like Gino said. And during the pandemic, we led. We led the DC region in our response to COVID. I think that we should continue on that prowess and continue to lead the area in regards to transportation. Thank you, Ashanti. I think when we are talking about transit equity, uh, the first thing that comes to mind is intentionality. I think when we create our transit policies, we have to have equity um, in the framework at center. Uh, just to echo what Gino said, you know, at Casa, we believe those closest to the pain must be closest to the power. And we have to have that same structure when we talk about the policies of our community, and especially when we talk about how we build out our transit systems. Uh, those individuals that are impacted the most often aren't at the table. Um, and so we need to ensure that they have a seat uh, for future conversations to come. Thank you. Clint, would you like to add something, especially with your transit frontline worker perspective? <laughs> well, I think Gino, Ray, Chris, and Ashanti sums it up all. And what I'm gonna say, and Ray said it earlier in the beginning when we were talking about it, um, and I strongly believe it myself, we have the best drivers, I, I would say throughout the country, because we as drivers, we do an amazing job, even with all the challenges that we faced throughout this COVID. We stepped up, we was there, we um, pursue every, every corner we make sure that we was able to get any passenger who was still out there we get them home and like i said we're the first one on the road if our first bus route goes up first driver reports at 3 40 in the morning and the last one leave after 1 1 a.m so we're like 24 hours 367 days a week and i know i could go on and tell you a lot of other good stuff but i know tina and samuel and everybody's gonna tell you more but I, what i'm gonna say from a driver point of view next time you even when you see a bu bus, you see a bus and you got a drop bus. Ray said it, he sums up good, it's a thankless job. Please just tell your driver, thank you for the work they're doing. Appreciate them for all the hard work and the sacrifice they made for not only themselves and their family, but for our community. Thank you, Clint, very well said. Um, Tina, do you have any closing comment? And then I want to ask Sam and Lindsay. I would just thank all the panelists for their dedication to keeping the transportation system in in the county. So um, it's so wonderful. I mean, we really do have an amazing, amazing suburban and you know semi-urban transportation system. It's it's the best. Thank you, Sam Samuel. Yes, thank you again. Uh, in December twenty first, we had a Transportation Equity Solidarity Day celebration. And one of our themes was interdependence. That is, we have a project, an initiative in our coalition uh, to link the principal stakeholders in public transportation, the essential workers, transit riders, transit workers. There's, we're inter interdependent. So in Baltimore, we had a spate of uh, shootings of drivers by riders. You can't shoot people you depend on. So this interdependence theme we're trying to build, and we have a, in our coalition uh, a transit solidarity coordinator. But in some, we want to teach the region 
what transit equity means, of course, and what it costs if we don't have it. If we don't have transit equity, Baltimore will never have a modern, equitable, reliable public transportation system. Thank you, Samuel. Lindsay? I um, just wanted to echo the thank you so much to all of the panelists and especially um, all the transit drivers who just work tirelessly each day to make sure that people can get to their health appointments, can get to school, can get to food. It's just so important and just for really putting, um, sacrificing so much. I just really appreciate it. Thank you, Lindsay. And I will give closing remarks with thank you to each and every one of you for the leadership and the work that you do on these issues. I know this is going to be an ongoing conversation and it's going to be work that is going to continue for years to come. Um, I have so, I'm someone who has used public transportation uh, growing up all my life and still continue to use it. My children have used public transportation as high school students. And I have been fortunate to have access to public transportation, but I know that in our county, there are many residents who still have to travel quite a lot to actually get access to public transportation. And transit equity means everybody having access to public transportation that is affordable, that is reliable, that, that can get them to jobs. If we are going to talk about making sure that people can um, live close to public transportation and use more public transportation so we have less single use vehicles, all these issues interconnect with making sure that we have um, you know, our health and safety of our transit workers is important and making sure that we invest in a robust and a good public transportation system. So thanks to all of you for the work that you are doing and it was a wonderful conversation and please continue uh, to collaborate. Have a good evening, everyone.